Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for coming. Um, yes, I'm David Dissedorp from SUSE. I work in the storage team there. And I'll be talking about um, just a project I worked on uh, for a, a hack week at SUSE, um, which was basically uh, a USB Ceph gateway. So a quick, quick look at the agenda. Um, I'll start off just with a, an introduction to the project itself. Uh, we'll take a look at, or just uh, have an overview of Ceph. Hopefully you caught the talks earlier, talks earlier about um, sort of the Ceph architecture and uh, how it solves all your storage problems. Um, a look at USB storage, so the USB storage stack in, in Linux. Um, then move on to a demonstration. So I'll do a live demo with uh, the board I have with me. Um, yeah, I have a, a Ceph cluster running on my laptop, so I'll sort of yeah, use that for the, for the test demo. And then look at um, how this could also be used for public storage, so uh, public cloud storage, so uh, where we have, say, uh, Amazon or uh, Azure behind the, the storage gateway. And finally, look at um, yeah, some future challenges. Uh, so what else could be done with a device like this or uh, this sort of project? And finish with a, a conclusion. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. So the project itself um, was sort of conceived with, with Hack Week. Um, so uh, as an engineer at SUSE, we get normally once or twice a year um, an event, or we have an event called Hack Week. And within Hack Week, we can work on whatever we feel like working on. So um, yeah, it's really a great time to sort of innovate within the company. Um, we can work on something which we're sort of passionate about. So in my case, it was I think a year or so ago now, I had I had an arm board, so a QB truck sort of gathering dust, got dust in the corner. Um, wanted to, to do something with it. I wanted to learn something new. Um, and I work on storage normally, so I thought, yeah, look, I'll combine these things and uh, create a, a USB storage gateway. Um, so in this case, we have uh, basically our, our USB host, so um, any stupid device with a USB port, which nowadays is pretty much everything. <laughs> um, I can then connect this USB gateway to my, my device uh, and basically access the Ceph cluster or the Ceph storage um, through USB. So the goals of the project, um, yeah, initially uh, my main goal was just to get something usable. Uh, so I thought, okay, this could then be, yeah, something at home. I could then potentially, say, run a Ceph cluster in my basement, then connect my stereo, my television, um, whatever else has a USB port, connect that and, and plumb it all into to Ceph for storage. Uh, another possibility would be booting from uh, the Ceph cluster. So most laptops nowadays can boot from USB. So you, know, you plug in the gateway, you boot straight from the, the Ceph cluster or the cloud storage. Encryption on the device itself. So um, in cases where I don't trust the, uh, the cloud storage, uh, especially for, for public cloud where I have no trust that they're going to um, you know, keep my data safe. So I want to do encryption on my side as close to, as close to the client as possible. Um, I can then keep the keys on, on the gateway, carry that with me, and yeah, don't share anything uh, with, with the public cloud or with the cloud. And finally, um, simple configuration. So uh, something like this, I didn't want to, to need to SSH into the, the board itself every time I wanted to change uh, the config there. So that was also a goal. So now I'll look at Ceph. Um, yeah, hopefully you caught the, the talks earlier. Um, it's, it's basically a project, uh, an amazing project, which uh, sort of uh, provides the ability to aggregate you know, a pool of hardware or the storage across that hardware um, and have a logical storage pool, which can then be carved up for, for block storage, for file system, for object storage. Um, yeah, it's scalable, there's no sort of single point of failure. Um, in this case, or in, 
for this project. Um, I'm mostly just focused on the Rados block device interface for Ceph. Um, so in this case, we have a, a block device image on the Ceph cluster, um, which is backed by uh, individual objects on the Ceph object store or Rados at the back end. So the Ceph RBD feature or interface has some quite cool features. Um, it offers, uh, yeah, it's thin provisions, so basically you're not consuming space within your Ceph cluster until you're writing to uh, the image. Um, yeah, resizable, so you can grow and shrink your images there. You can also do things like snapshots and, and clones. And there's also, uh, yeah, support within the Linux kernel. So uh, with Linux, you can basically map a Rados block device image. It appears as a, a local block device, and you could use that as you would any other disk. Um, on the user space side, there's uh, for QEMU um, yeah, integration, so you can run virtual machines with QEMU, and that's then backed by uh, Rados block device images on the set cluster. So now look at the hardware that I had um, for this uh, USB gateway project. So I started with uh, the top left there, which is a, a QB truck. Um, yeah, that's uh, so a, a dual core uh, Cortex 9. Uh, yeah, dual core A20, so all in an A20 board um, with uh, gigabit, uh, gigabit Ethernet. Um, yeah, what else does it have? So it's got a USB on the go port, which is obviously what's needed um, for this project. It has a bunch of other things on there which just really aren't, aren't required and yeah, uh, make the board a whole lot bigger and less portable. Um, so yeah, after that I moved on to the NanoPi Neo, uh, which is this board here. Uh, this is sort of, I think it's four centimeters by four centimeters, so it's very much something you could, or I could imagine carrying with me and you know, plugging it in and using it um, on the go. Um, both of them are relatively inexpensive, so the uh, NanoPi Neo is under $10. Uh, yeah, so certainly doable price-wise. Um, yeah, performance-wise, they're not great in that, or at least the NanoPi Neo has uh, 100 megabits network and, and USB 2, so um, yeah, it would be nice to try something with more powerful hardware, but um, yeah, at this stage, well, it wasn't um, a priority, so um, yeah, the big benefit of using these boards is that they have, uh, thanks to the uh, Sunsea community, uh, they have excellent mainline kernel support. Um, there's also a, an OpenSUSE Tumbleweed port for both boards, um, uh, which, which is something, you know, obviously working at SUSE, I wanted to run OpenSUSE on, on a board like that. Um, so USB storage, um, I won't go into uh, huge detail. Um, yeah, I'd recommend a talk by uh, Christoph Oparsiak. So he spoke yesterday on USB. It was a great talk sort of going through the details of USB on Linux. Um, this is just sort of listing what I used or what I needed to configure for this project. Uh, so USB is or can be used as a, a SCSI transport, um, which is how I'm using it in this case. Uh, so the two options there, bulk only transport and uh, USB attached SCSI. Uh, USB attached SCSI is then a, a, a more recent um, addition to, to USB and that allows for things like uh, command tag queuing um, and I think also out of order completion on, on USB 3. Uh, the USB gadget stack in Linux includes uh, two modules for, for handling this. Um, so we have the mass storage KO, um, which is what I ended up using, but there's also FTCM, which sort of plums into the uh, Linux kernel SCSI target. Uh, so that's basically a, a SCSI transport uh, for USB in Linux. So the, the gateway itself, um, as you saw, uh, all of the features are already there in Linux. Um, 
I mean, we have the Rados block device kernel client. Uh, we have the USB gadget stack, which um, supports USB mass storage. There's really not that much to do. Uh, for encryption, there's uh, de-encrypt. Uh, in the end, the project itself was, or is mostly just about configuring these different components and making it you know, relatively easy to, to do that. So here's sort of a look at um, how the board's configured or um, yeah, how I've set up this, this gateway. Um, so basically what we have is um, yeah, a board that then boots uh, Linux once it's connected. Um, and initially we boot into, or we expose a, a configuration file system via USB. So this is just a, a RAM disk um, where you can, yeah, you can provide your Ceph credentials to access the Ceph cluster. You can specify which image you want exposed via the board. Um, yeah, Lux key for de-encrypt. Um, and once you're done with that, uh, you can eject, uh, so this is exposed as a, an ejectable uh, logical unit. Um, so once, once that is then ejected, um, we intercept that eject or we detect it and then basically process the user configuration. So basically at that stage we can you know, remount that image and take the set credentials and look at uh, what needs to be exposed and um, go ahead and do that and expose it via USB. So um, now on to the demo. So as I already said, I have uh, my Ceph cluster running on my laptop. Um, so it's yeah, just a very simple vstart cluster. Um, let me just bring up console. Okay, uh, not really. So there you can see I have my Ceph cluster running uh, with three OSDs, one monitor. Um, these are all just local processes on the laptop. And now what I'll do is go ahead and, and connect to my gateway. So let's plug that in. Um, so one thing I should say I haven't really worked on optimizing is the boot time of the, the gateway itself. Um, so normally you would expect that you know, once you connect your USB key, you can immediately access the storage there. So uh, at this stage, it's still sort of in the tens of seconds until it boots and then eventually shows the configuration file system. So I'll just wait a little there. It's just coming up now. There we go. Um, so I have my device notification saying that there's a new uh, USB device. Um, so you can see this config file system here. So what this then has, uh, this is exposed, as I said earlier, as a RAM, or it's backed by a RAM disk. We have our RBD USB conf. So in here, basically, I'm saying, OK, I want to expose the uh, USB image on my RBD pool uh, within the Ceph cluster. Um, I have my Ceph user that I want to use there. Close that. Um, in this case, I have a uh, run conf flag. So what this basically says is that when the gateway boots, it should first expose the configuration file system, uh, which is what we're seeing here. So if I want it to boot immediately and expose Ceph, um, then what I can do is go ahead and delete that file. Um, de-encrypt, so that's where we configure our uh, de-encrypt Lux keys. Oop. And within Ceph, um, I just have the standard ceph.conf and the, the key ring there. So one thing I want to do is just copy uh, the ceph.conf and key ring uh, that I have for my Ceph cluster. Just do that from the command line. Good. So 
So bring that back up. So now uh, the other thing I mentioned was that once we eject uh, this configuration file system, that uh, configuration is processed or committed, um, and we should then see whoop, the Rados block device image appear, and there it is uh, as Seth down there. So basically, uh, the gateway has committed the, the configuration, uh, connects to the Ceph cluster on my laptop, and then maps it and exposes it via USB. Um, so here uh, we can see, whoops, so I have yeah, a one gigabyte uh, image there, which is, is now exposed and uh, connected by USB. Yes? Yes, I did. So in this case, I have a FAT file system on the device. Um, and I'll, I'll use, so the reason why I have it as, as FAT rather than EXT or XFS or ButterFS uh, is because I now wanted to demonstrate um, a, a stupid device accessing the, the Ceph storage. So what I have here is, is uh, just a stock Android mobile phone, which obviously has no knowledge of, of Ceph. Um, but what I can also do is uh, connect the USB gateway now to, to the Android phone. So in this case, Android supports FAT32 uh, as you know, USB stick. Um, so what I want to do <coughs> is then wait for the board to boot. And just so we've got some data to write to the Ceph cluster, a quick photo. Okay. Um, and it should come up any time now. Hopefully. Yes, there it is. So I'll just copy over that uh, photo to the gateway. So I basically see that as I would any other USB uh, storage device. And I'll copy that. And now I can go ahead and eject it. Done, so that's ejected. I can power down the, the gateway now. But what I'll do is use now just the um, Rados block device client on my laptop just to map that image, just so we can confirm that uh, what we wrote, so this photo is, is actually there on the Ceph cluster. So I'm mapping. I've mapped the USB image there. Just need to mount it as well. Good. And there I can see that I've, so this is just, as I said, using the Rudder Spock device client on my laptop. Uh, the gateway isn't involved. Uh, but there we can see the, the photo that I, oops, it's on this. So there's a very blurry photo of <laughs> what I took earlier. Well, um, that's the demo. So now, back on with the talk. So any questions about the demonstration at this stage, or shall I go on? Yes, please. Um, so what I have is basically uh, once it can't access, so if the, the gateway boots and can't access the Ceph cluster, so if you boot it without network access, then it uh, basically exposes the config because it knows something has to be done. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so next off, uh, I also wanted to use uh, the same thing for public cloud storage. So in this case, uh, if I didn't have a Ceph cluster at home, um, 
yeah, I, I could then use, say, a public uh, cloud storage provider like uh, Azure or um, Amazon S3 um, and use exactly the same technology or components to, uh, yeah, have a gateway for, for that. Uh, with uh, Microsoft Azure, um, there's basically a, a protocol or a RESTful protocol for accessing the virtual machine images in the Azure cloud. Um, so I wrote, uh, this was in a, a prior hack week, I wrote a client which speaks that protocol. Um, so the idea was then to um, yeah, basically map between the uh, SCSI requests coming in from the USB host into this um, Azure uh, RESTful uh, protocol for um, their blob I.O. So with this, um, I use the um, LIO, so in-kernel SCSI target. Uh, with LIO, there's a user space backend, which is a TCMU runner. Uh, I think that was added by uh, Andy Grover from Red Hat uh, worked on that. Um, so basically, with this backend, um, we have yeah, something running in user space, which then receives the SCSI request from the USB host. Um, with that backend, I just map that to then a, a public cloud request, so an Azure um, block blob request, and that goes into the cloud. So this uses the uh, Elasto Cloud client, um, which is a project I worked on for that. Um, this is basically just a, a POSIX-like uh, library for yeah, performing uh, RESTful Cloud I.O. Um, as I said earlier, I have then the LIO backend, which handles mapping of, of the SCSI requests to uh, the Elasto library calls. So it looks something like this for uh, the public cloud case. Here we have uh, the USB host on the left um, connected to the USB gateway. That goes, or the SCSI requests are then processed by the uh, Linux iSCSI target, or sorry, SCSI target. Um, there's TCMU uh, above or below that, um, basically as the user space backend. And finally, there's Elasto, which handles speaking with the uh, Microsoft Azure cloud. Okay. Um, Next up, testing. Um, yeah, so with this project, I didn't really want to, or at least initially, I was testing everything on the hardware itself, which is a little fiddly when you're, you know, plugging in, um, pulling out cables all day. Um, so I found later on there was this uh, dummy HCD module uh, within the Linux kernel. This is great for testing exactly uh, something like this, um, where basically uh, you're you can use that as a, as a loopback in a single system. So in my case, I just had a VM with everything on there and uh, used the USB loopback functionality to test it. So now on to future challenges. Um, so in the hack week that I had, uh, or the one week I had, I think um, yeah, I proved that it is perfectly possible to 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 have something like this. I think it is a, a reasonable uh, device or something which is, is usable potentially to others. Um, but I think there are still yeah, plenty of, of things which, which could be done or it could be improved in many different ways. Um, yeah, the first on the list I have is, is con concurrent image access. So imagine where you have, uh, say, you know, if they cost under $10, then you could imagine maybe buying 10 of these and sort of exposing maybe the same image via these gateways. In that case, you would need a way to, to manage um, exposing a consistent image to all of those uh, hosts or connected hosts. In that case, I think um, using something, so yeah, avoiding a clustered file system and using something like uh, just snapshots where the first gateway to map sees or has right access to the, the parent um, and then any subsequent connects just get a, a snapshot which was taken as the first uh, host connected. Um, I think that may be uh, something which would yeah, make having concurrent access usable anyway. Um, some other challenges. Um, so power is definitely a challenge. Um, I have had problems powering the board from 
yeah, portable devices like mobile phones, it's uh, yeah, really a little unsure whether uh, the board will come up or not. So one option would be to add a, a battery to the board so you're not so reliant on um, power from the USB host. Uh, FTCM, so this is the um, LIO uh, USB transport that plumbs straight into the, yeah, the Linux kernel SCSI targets. I didn't actually get that working on uh, the board, um, so I wanted to sort of have an, another play around with that and see whether yeah, it was a hardware issue or whether um, I just didn't set it up right. Caching, um, so many of these embedded boards have you know, uh, uh, some onboard storage or in this case an SD card um, and when the root file system is you know, under one gigabyte you could use the rest of that SD card or um, onboard storage for caching as a, a read cache or a, a write back cache. Um, that would certainly be something to look at. Um, oh, uh, there's caching again. but. <laughs> Uh, performance wise, so I think at this stage most important would be the boot time. So you saw it takes yeah, tens of seconds to come up and expose the storage. Um, one thing I did have, or at least with the uh, QB truck, uh, I did try running everything from the init RAM FS, uh, which would actually worked quite well. So in that case I had it booting in, yeah, I think it was three or four seconds, so it was much quicker but it's a little ugly um, implementation wise. Also in terms of raw storage performance, um, I think having USB 3 and yeah, gigabit ethernet um, or fast Wi-Fi would be uh, yeah, great. The only problem is that these boards are quite expensive and they're also not as portable as, or at least the ones I've seen aren't as portable as the uh, Nano Pioneer. Um, in conclusion, uh, yeah, Ceph is, is fantastic. Um, uh, it, it solves all of your storage problems. I would just say, recommend using it. Uh, anyone that hasn't tried it out. Um, in terms of utilizing Ceph from yeah, many devices or opening up Ceph to many more devices, I think something like a USB gateway is uh, useful for that. I think it's a, a viable option for something like that. Um, I think as in particular um, using encryption on the board itself is particularly beneficial for uh, a public cloud or where it's backed by a public cloud. Um, yeah, uh, cheap hardware, um, really under $10 it makes something like this or a project like this quite, quite possible, quite viable. And, and having open source or uh, Linux kernel mainline mainline kernel support uh, for something like this is uh, hugely beneficial. But otherwise, looks like I'm a little early, but um, yeah, I, I guess I'd like to thank um, beforehand uh, the upstream Sunsea community for, for kernel hacking and getting these boards working. Uh, they do really an amazing job. And also, uh, so Andreas Ferber, uh, Dirk Muller, and uh, Alex Graf from SUSE, because they've also worked on the uh, open SUSE tumbleweed port for these, these boards. Um, otherwise, any questions? Uh, yes? What uh, boundaries were you able to achieve on USB 2 with the uh, USB 2 and the USB 3? So the question was uh, what sort of band bandwidth or performance could I get with USB 2? Um, on the, so I mostly did benchmarking on the QB truck board, which has a, a gigabit ethernet port. Um, in that case, it was bottlenecked by the, the USB 2 port, and I think it was, yeah, it was sort of 10 to 15 megabytes per second um, throughput um, via USB to the, to the Ceph cluster. Um, in this case, my Ceph cluster is, is memory backed anyway, so yeah, the bandwidth, or oh, sorry, the bottleneck was, um, very much the uh, USB 2 port on the board. Um, other questions? Yes? Do you get that kind of throughput when you are encrypting, or is the CPU limiting you at that point? I haven't done um, benchmarks with encryption yet. So the all winner chips include basically um, yeah, offload support for certain um, encryption types. 
Um, it's not fully implemented on the H3 chip. Uh, so the A20, I think, was done. Uh, the H3 is still work in progress from the upstream Sun Sea guys. Uh, but yeah, I think once that's done, uh, it shouldn't be too much of a performance penalty. So the, the question was, have I considered uh, yeah, using a, a much smaller Linux distribution? Um, yeah, I work for SUSE, so obviously uh, playing with um, OpenSUSE is uh, something I like doing. Um, uh, but uh, that said, I could also, uh, so I, I mentioned I had it running from initramfs uh, on OpenSUSE. So I could also just um, build this in at RAMFS um, and do everything from that. In that case, it was also like 15 megabytes uh, with everything on there uh, to run this project. So it certainly is possible to use yeah, minimal um, setup and, and yeah, run everything uh, very quickly. Yes? Yes, sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's so. This is a problem with any uh, USB storage, right? Um, uh, normally, I think most hosts are configured to do um, yeah synchronous I/O to the the USB storage. Um, you should always eject the device before you unplug. Um, same goes for any other USB key. So I don't think it differs too much in that regard from a regular USB key. Yes. Uh, network outages on. Yeah. But the, but this is uh, completely synchronous on the gateway side, so um, yeah, it's not buffering anything. So if you basically if you lose network access, then you won't get successful successful IOs on the USB side. So any USB request won't be acknowledged as successful until it's basically reached the Ceph storage, and then Ceph obviously does its magic for replication at the back end. Once the gateway has a completion, uh, then it will finally acknowledge to the USB host that the I/O is successfully complete. So um, yeah, it's really not not doing much in that regard. Uh, there's no buffering on the gateway at, at this stage. One more question. Yes. So, so this, uh, so the question was, um, uh, how do you manage uh, accessing the configuration again? Um, this is something Lens asked earlier. Uh, so. Uh, basically, if the board comes up or the gateway comes up and can't access the Ceph cluster using the configuration that was provided, then um, it returns to exposing a configuration file system. And actually, it also copies the log onto the config file system, which is, for debugging, quite cool. So you can see, OK, um, it processed the config, couldn't connect to the Ceph cluster, or the, the image isn't there. Um, this is the error I get. And then, yeah, you can reconfigure your, your board at that stage. Yeah, exactly. Yes. Exactly. You can you can boot it with that network, and then you'll see your config again. Yeah. Yes, someone. Is it possible to expose more than one disk? So the question was um, whether more than one image could be exposed. Uh, yes. Um, at this stage, you saw the config file. Um, it's not really set up 
to handle that, but yeah, it would be easily doable. Um, so you could expose multiple images. Uh, the question is then whether the host supports multiple uh, LUNs or whether, say, your stereo or television, whether you can then access, um, say, LUN 1 or something aside from the, the default or the first. Any other questions? Otherwise, uh, yes, one last. We get the code somewhere. I'm guessing it's more secure code than everybody Yeah, it's actually a pretty ugly shell script. Um, yeah, I, the reason why I wrote it in shell was because I was initially playing around with doing it from init RD, uh, in which case there's no Python, there's no Perl, there's no Go. Um, yeah, I think at this stage I'd prefer to rewrite it in um, something a little nicer. I was considering maybe a, a Rust project just so I can play with Rust, but yeah. Um, so the, the link for the, the code itself is just that top link um, for Elasto, so this um, cloud storage client. Um, it's also on GitHub. Uh, TCMU runner, so this was Andy Grover's <coughs> project. Um, yeah. There's the OpenSUSE link for uh, Tumbleweed on, on a lot of these arm boards, and of course the Sunsea community. Okay, well, thanks for coming. anything behind it. Yep. Absolutely.
Management with OpenEdX. Hi, thank you very much. Um, first of all, even though I have a mic, I don't think it's really amplified well. I have a very weak voice. If I need to speak up, just wave to me and... and already? Okay. Boy, that'll be a challenge. <laughs> Can you hear me? So there's no amplification through the mic. I hope at least the video stream can hear me. Um, yes, hi there. I'd like to give a small talk about a small project I'm involved in since uh, July 2015 called Open Attic. Um, let me dive right in. I have probably way too much slides for the time I have. Let's see how far we can come. Um, so basically, what does Open Attic do? What was the vision behind it? It started about six years ago by now. Um, uh, it started as so many other open source projects with uh, somebody had to scratch his own itch because there was a problem that they needed a solution for, so they thought, well, we can do this by ourselves, they're going with it. In this case, the situation was that um, the, the company, IT Novum, where, where Open Attic evolved from, um, they were a spin-off of another company were doing data center operations for them and they needed storage. So. Um, as you probably are aware nowadays, storage exceeds the boundaries of hardware much faster than people can shove hard disks in. Um, data growth everywhere. So, and they needed to replace a number of proprietary storage systems and were quite surprised by the price tags that they, by the quotes that they received. So they thought, why can't we do this differently? And, and if you look at it, a Linux distribution nowadays gives you everything you need to set up a fully fledged storage system. You just buy cheap commodity hardware shop in lots of hard disks and you have a server that fulfills most of the common needs. Um, so the idea was, okay, Linux by itself is good, it has everything, but you need something on top that makes it a bit more approachable, easier to manage and unified because in many, in many cases you have administrators that might be familiar with using a UI, but they are not that familiar on the command line. Um, so OpenAtic's vision really was to, to give a a more friendly user interface and a unified experience to managing all kinds of storage. Um, storage here meaning both um, what is usually called NAS storage, so file-based like Samba or NFS, but also block-based storage protocols, particularly iSCSI would be an example here. Um, and later on during the, the life cycle of OpenAttic, they also realized that um, single server instances or even multi-node configurations can't keep up with the storage requirements. Uh, and the developers looked around and figured out that Ceph might be quite a nice alternative here, which is a distributed storage system in which you not just have a single server where you add more disks, but you simply throw in more servers or even complete racks if you need more storage. And Ceph pretty much organizes itself to make use of the storage to ensure the redundancy and, and make sure um, yeah, it, it scales along with the hardware that you give it to him. Um, so it started as an in-house project and later became a, an open source product, I would call it. Um, the idea behind it was that there was an enterprise version and a community version and that the company would then sell licenses with added support and other value on top to monetize on the software. Um, interestingly, that didn't really work out. So. Um, when I joined the company in July, July 2015, we made a, a number of drastic changes to how Open Attic was governed and managed and, and yeah, run as a project. Before that, basically, the, the developers all worked in-house at the company and the development took place, like with many proprietary products, very internally phased and every once in a while they released their community version but there wasn't really a community around it so there wasn't an infrastructure that was inviting for users to, to come and, and work with the project so that's something that we've changed drastically um, also we we got rid of the dual licensing that was in place um, back then the the enterprise edition had a few additional bits on top that you would have to pay for all of this was folded into a single code tree released under the GPL and we had, uh, since then there's no distinction between enterprise and communities, just open attic going forward. Um, we also got rid of the requirement for contributors signing a contributor license agreement. So similar to Ceph, basically if you contribute to open attic, all we require is that you add a sign offline to your commit message, similar to how the Linux kernel and many other open source, source projects do it nowadays. So um, 
the, the bar for contributing code is much lower nowadays and that was really noticeable by the, yeah, by just the amount and the growth of the community that we've seen since then. <clears throat> um, we also opened up a lot of other things that used to be internal, most popular of course is the bug tracker. We are based on Atlassian Jira and we now have a publicly hosted Jira instance that's fully open so you can really see all the issues, um, all roadmap planning, everything is transparent and open. You can leave comments, you can vote on it, you can submit bug reports like you would expect from any other open source project. Um, we also changed the way of how we work on the code. We, we now make much more use of different code branches. We have established a process for performing pull requests and doing commenting on them. Um, these were all things that were quite new to the open attic developer, so we, we learned as we go along and, and it's a process that now basically there's no difference if you are paid for working in open attic or if you are a community contributor it's all going through the same procedures same requirements and the same expectations um, we also switched the release model nowadays we try to come up with a new open attic release at least once per month roughly every four or five six four to five weeks um, and we have nightly builds if you're curious. So if you are looking for testing a new feature that has just been committed and you don't want to wait for the next release, um, just take a nightly build. Um, yeah, with regards to feature developments, we, we have kind of like a train model. So basically, people work in parallel on features. And once they're ready and they've passed the review and have passed all the tests, then they will be merged into the, the development branch that will eventually become the next release. But if, if a developer doesn't make it in time, since we are on a monthly cycle, there's not just a really long period before he has another opportunity to get his stuff merged in. So that really helped accelerating the whole development process and making changes to the project. Um, also, in the beginning, many different components were managed in separate code repositories. So like the documentation was in one repo, tests were in another one, and integrating them and getting them aligned was always a bit of a challenge so we simply lumped all of these repos together into one single repo which now means that you could basically now can work on a feature write the documentation create the tests and have them all in a single branch and commit and merge them at the same time so it's it's much more easy to keep track and, and keep the stuff synchronized um, a few key aspects of OpenAttic. Um, we are well aware that we're not alone, especially when it comes to storage management. There are quite a number of projects out there that do similar things that we do. Um, so we try to come up with a few yeah, cornerstones of what we would like to focus on. Primarily, um, the goal is storage management and, and storage management only. You, you see many projects that start also doing things like managing uh, containers or plugins. So they are more, sometimes more aimed at home users that want to have a, an appliance somewhere in the corner that isn't just a file server, but maybe also an own cloud instance or provides a BitTorrent server or what have not. Um, this is currently fully out of scope. So we really focus just on managing your storage and exposing it through various protocols and, and that's it. Um, yeah, Ceph support is something that we've added recently that's quite noticeable. Um, of course, we are fully GPL v2. Um, no arbitrary functional restrictions. So there are a lot of free storage management systems that you can download and use, but they apply some form of limitation on you. For example, for the amount of data that you can store in it or the amount of concurrent users or what have not. And if you reach that limit, you all of a sudden need to buy a license or pay for, for getting over that barrier. That's not the case with the OpenAttic. You are free to do with it whatever you want in, in what sizes you want to use it. Um, we're based on standard Linux tools. As I said, most distributions provide all the, the frameworks and tools that you need to set up such a system by default. It's just a matter of orchestrating them and making them more accessible to the user, and that's the, the part that we're taking on. We try hard to support multiple Linux distributions. Um, originally, OpenEdit came from the Debian corner, so we started with Debian, added Ubuntu later on. Um, since about two years ago, we started adding RPMs for CentOS and Enterprise Linux. Um, we added SUSE as well. And this gives us um, an opportunity compared to some other storage management systems that sometimes are based on non-Linux um, operating systems. Um, one key 
concern that sometimes comes up here is, is hardware support that um, most vendors have pretty solid support when it comes to providing Linux drivers in, in the server space, but if you're getting into non-Linux but unix -y operating systems, the driver situation can sometimes be a bit more challenging. So that, that usually helps us to, to get adoption. We don't enforce a choice of Linux distribution on you. You can basically use what you feel familiar with as the base platform and can put open attic on top. Okay, what can we do so far? What's the, the, the functionality of OpenEdit like? So basically, the technology consists of two separate components. The, the most noticeable one is the, the web UI. That is what you see. Um, with OpenEdit version 2.0, that started about two and a half years ago. We switched from an XJS based um, to an AngularJS based from web front end. So we use um, JavaScript libraries to make the UI yeah, visually appealing and, and easy to use. Um, the back end is the other component which has a RESTful API. That's also a new addition in version 2 that we're working on. Um, the, the, the former version 1.x was using XML RPC. Um, so the RESTful API makes it a bit more easier to talk to with the back end. And the web end front end only uses the REST API. So everything that you can accomplish by, by the, the web interface can also be accomplished by calling REST API calls. Um, yeah, and with regards to storage, we provide the usual suspects um, in, in its simplest form and, and, and where OpenEdit comes from, that you have group these hard disks with the logical volume manager LVM into a, a, a storage pool. Um, we also support the ZFS file system or the ButterFS file system if you prefer. So um, we, you have a, a basic storage unit, which is the storage pool, and OpenEdit can then be used to carve out volumes out of that pool based on your requirements. Um, we re support a number of file systems. Um, as I said, ZFS is one of the file systems we support, um, ButterFS for other use cases. So you can really choose how to configure storage for the workload at hand that you um, want to serve. We are in the process of, of adding support for um, DRBD, the distributed replicated block device. So in a multi-node setup where you have, um, let's say, two OpenATIC instances, you can configure that a volume that you create on the one node will be replicated synchronously to the second node for redundancy purposes. Um, the backend support has been in place for quite a while already, and we are now in the final stretch of finishing the UI parts of that as well. So that's a pull request that's really getting close to review now. Um, we also do storage monitoring in the back end. So one of the things, if you, of course, as I said, you can just use Linux and, and set up a share and, and create a small file server by yourself. But something, something that usually gets forgotten during that process is making sure that the storage is properly monitored. And then your users become your monitoring system because they will scream once their disk runs full. Um, OpenATIC basically automates this process. So each time you create a new volume, we'll also reconfigure the monitoring framework in the background to make sure that it's being tracked and you see the utilization. Um, and then, as I said, local storage is where OpenATIC comes from. With the addition of Ceph, we are now starting to make, um, yeah, we want to add functionality that makes it easy to manage the Ceph cluster to create new storage objects like um, block devices or new Ceph pools. Also start doing monitoring so you get an insight of how your Ceph cluster is doing. This is the functionality that we're now um, most actively working on at the moment. Um, and this combined with the, the, the recent changes that I've just talked about with opening the project was something that um, SUSE got curious. And we had a development partnership with SUSE for the entire last year, basically. So we worked together with SUSE developers on advancing the Ceph functionality. Um, and in November, SUSE um, agreed on acquiring the team and the project from IT Novum. We're now part of SUSE since then. But this doesn't really mean that we will now ditch support for all the other distributions. There are no intentions to change how the project is being run and governed. So components, as I said, we have, on the one hand, the back end. Um, as you can see, we're using pretty boring technology here, bread and butter stuff. 
this is by intention because since we need to support multiple distributions, we need to figure out, okay, what's the, the common tool set that we can use? If you start making choices that are not available in all of, on any of the distributions, it will be difficult to support it over there. Um, so the, the OpenEdit backend is written in Django. It's a Python application. Usually um, Django is used as an application server for, yeah, let's say web shops or something like that. But it turns out that the whole way how, how Django organizes data and how it's structured with Django models makes it a very suitable um, framework for something like a storage management system as well. And basically, Django is the abstraction layer and underneath we are calling the regular Linux tools um, that an administrator would also use. So for example, if you create a new volume, we are calling VG create or LV create, MKFS, all the steps that you as an administrator would have to perform step by step to come to the same goal and are automated by OpenATIC. Um, for the monitoring, we currently are based on Nagis or Isinga and using PNP for Nagis for the graphs, um, which we are storing in our defaults. I have a, a, a picture about that. When it comes to Ceph, um, the, the current functionality is using Librado, so basically the, the, the common API that is used to talk with the Ceph cluster to obtain information or to, to issue um, yeah, administrative commands. And we're now in the process of, of doing more than just talking to an existing Ceph cluster. We would like to be able to also set up and configure and manage a, a cluster. And this is where SALT comes into place. Um, SALT is a yeah, deployment and automation framework. And SUSE is also working on um, Ceph-specific management functionality based on SALT. That's a project called um, DeepSea. And there's a talk by Jan later on in this room at 3 p.m. if you want to learn more about it. Um, yep, the web front end, as I said, AngularJS, Bootstrap, also pretty, well, in, in web developer terms, pretty boring stuff by now, but it gets the job done. And yeah, we are working on improving the functionality and adding more every day, basically. Um, we also put a strong emphasis on testing. So each commit or each new functionality is supposed to be accompanied by a number of tests. We, we test on three different layers, basically. We have Python unit tests, um, where we use the, the Django unit <coughs> test framework. Um, the entire application is um, tested through a test suite that is named Gatling that we developed ourselves, in which um, it calls the REST API directly and automates the testing on that level. And we also have automated tests for the full web UI based on Protractor Jasmine where you basically are remote controlling a web browser to simulate clicks on the UI and to check if the web UI gives you the expected results. That's the architecture from in a visual point of view. So you have the Django application in the middle. Um, some data is persisted in the Postgres database. If you want to set up a multi-node um, open attic system, the only thing that it needs to be shared is the Postgres database. So if you have a second node, you connect them both to the same Postgres database and then you can use one web UI of OpenATIC to manage your two nodes together. Um, since the Django application doesn't have root privileges, we have a, a separate process which is um, called the OpenATIC system D, which cannot, should not be confused with Leonard Pettering system D. That's a coincidence. But this is a root process that communicates with the Django application through Dbus and performs the actual shell commands that will get you to the required results, like creating a volume, creating a file system, setting up a share. And you can basically take a look at the command log of system D to, to check all the commands that we're issuing to get the job done. Um, with regards to communicating with a Ceph cluster, um, as I said, currently this is mostly based on Librados, LibRBD. This is a quick overview of how the monitoring takes place. Um, again, the system D doesn't only configure the storage itself, but it also uses um, Jinja um, and creates um, Nagios configuration files based on templates, and then, then restarts Nagios to make sure that the new um, storage um, objects are being properly monitored. Um, PNP for Nagios stores this information in round robin databases, and then we use the backend to take out that information to visualize it. Right now, this is. Um, used um, with RID tool, 
which creates PNG graphs. Um, for Ceph, we are also using RID tool to export JSON data, and the rendering takes place on the web UI instead of just displaying static PNGs. This is how it looks like for Ceph. It's a bit more complicated here. Um, since we are using the Django application to talk to the Ceph cluster, and we have a Nagus plugin that sends its check queries through the, the Nagus, uh, the Django application. But then again, it writes the data to RD. We use the JSON export for the visualization. So what are we working on at the moment? What's going, what's cooking? Um, particularly, as I said, the DRBD stuff needs to get finished. This is something that we've been working on for quite a while. And one of the things we're currently missing is that um, we, we depend on the storage pools that we managed to be existing before. So if you want to use ZFS, um, you have to manually create the Z pool on the command line first before we can make use of it. Similar for LVM, um, once you have that storage pool configured, you can tell OpenAttic to register it and then creating the actual volumes on top of it can be done through the UI. But that's something, of course, that we would like to change. So that's work in progress. Um, iSCSI fiber channel functionality needs to be expanded. There's quite a lot of things that we haven't um, looked at yet. Um, we track all the things that are still open in the JIRA, so we're not just tracking bugs there, but all the ideas that we have, um, and we try to group them into um, bigger stories to, to, yeah, to have um, useful chunks of, of work that somebody can take a look at. Um, when it comes to Ceph, we, we, we just defined a few goals beforehand. Um, we want to be able to both manage and monitor a Ceph cluster through the UI and, and give a tool that you as a Ceph administrator actually want to use. Right now, there are a few tools out there that give you sometimes a little bit of monitoring, sometimes a bit of management, but we try to come up with a solution that gives you a more rounded experience here. Um, especially considering that a Ceph cluster can become quite large with lots of objects um, that we make it or that we visualize it in a way that you're not getting overwhelmed and you only see the information that's really relevant for you at this point in time. Because, well, ideally, Ceph is supposed to be kind of managing uh, itself and healing itself, but you still maybe want to know about what's going on in, in the background. Um, and very importantly, you should still be able to use the command line tools to make changes to your cluster without OpenAttic getting confused by it. That's one of the, the, the big challenges that we had to face um, for the, the local storage systems that we manage. We basically assume that OpenAttic is in charge of the configuration. And once you have started using OpenAttic for the storage management, um, well, you can make changes manually, but OpenAttic will simply overwrite them the next time if you haven't made sure that OpenAttic is aware of them. And for Ceph, um, we are trying harder to make sure that this is possible. So if you're using the Ceph command line tools to create, let's say, another Ceph pool or an RBD, OpenAttic needs to be aware of that. And that was a bit of a challenge, by the way, of how Django works and how it, it, it persists data and information. I wish I had more time to talk about that, but um, if we have time in the end, maybe if you're interested, I can share some of the ideas that we have there. So what works when it comes to Ceph? We have a, a cluster status dashboard. So you basically can see the overall cluster health, some of the performance indicators with graphs and everything. Um, you can manage Ceph pools. You can monitor them, including erasure coded profiles for the pools. Um, you are able to create RADOS block devices through the web UI. Um, you can delete them again. They are monitored. Um, we also start looking into the infrastructure. So you have the, the OSD manage. Well, it's not management yet, but you can at least see the, all the OSDs that are in your cluster in what state they are in. Um, when you're using DeepC as the backend to configure a Ceph cluster, you also get an inventory list of all the nodes that your cluster consists of and which role they have. Um, you can take a look at the, the Ceph crush map, which is the basically the algorithm that determines of how data is distributed in your cluster, what kind of redundancy you have configured, and how, how the data should be distributed among the various um, availability levels, so to say. Uh, and we also want to make 
it's possible that you can manage multiple Ceph clusters within one open attic instance. So let's say you have a, a production Ceph cluster and a staging or a testing Ceph cluster, you can use one tool to manage them both. Roadmap, well, that's just a small glimpse. We have quite a long laundry, laundry list of stuff that we still want to accomplish. Um, the dashboard needs some more love and we would like to make much more information about the Ceph cluster visible from the dashboard. Um, we also noticed that um, based on, on, the, on the nature of Ceph that some tasks take some time. So you, you issue a command to, to, lit, to trigger an action in the Ceph cluster and it works and it may take some time and you have no way of, of knowing how much time it takes but as a web application your browser can't just stand still and wait because you would run into a timeout. So um, one of the things that we had to come up with is uh, a queuing mechanism where you can simply enqueue see these jobs that take longer and then make sure that you get notified once it's finished so the web application doesn't hang or you run into timeouts. Um, yeah, the whole part about deploying and, and remote configuration of nodes um, with, with SALT is something that we are very closely working on with the deep sea developers. Um, so as a next step, you should not only be able to see all the existing nodes, but we would like to make it possible for you to simply boot up a new node that registers with SALT and you will see that a new node has joined and use uh, a salt minion basically, and you could then use Open Attic to assign a role to that node. Let's say this is going to be a new OSD, click, and then DeepC will does its job to configure the node um, accordingly. Um, more monitoring, um, iSCSI target management is also something that we are looking into. So basically, you define one node in your cluster as an iSCSI target host in which RBD images from the Ceph cluster will be made available as iSCSI targets. Um, OpenAttic already supports that, but only on the local node where OpenAttic is running on. So usually, if you consider the OpenAttic node as a management node, it's usually not having the performance um, parameters that you would need for a full-fledged iSCSI target server. Usually that should be a, a bit more powerful machine. And, and to avoid having to install Open Attic on that node as well, we are now looking into using um, DeepSea and Salt for that, for that instead. Um, yeah, Rados Gateway is another big construction site. Um, the thing is that a Ceph cluster consists of several components and, and, and they, they have their own way of how they are being managed. They have their own APIs of how you need to talk to them. In the case of Rados Gateway, for example, there's a Rados Gateway Admin Ops API which you need to use to talk with the gateway for um, creating and managing the users and, and, and um, the buckets and so on. So we need to develop the, the interface on our end to establish that communication path. Um, and the existing functionality like um, the RBD management or the pool management still needs a lot of more features that we're working on. And also um, monitoring is one of the things that we need to expand right now. Um, the expectation is that OpenAttic and the Nagus instance runs on that node. In a distributed cluster like Ceph, this is not going to scale, so we are looking for a more lightweight approach. Um, the current plan is that we will be using CollectD for that, so each um, Ceph node also runs CollectD, configured in a way that it just forwards the, the monitoring data to a central CollectD instance. So you have a, a way to consolidate the monitoring data on one node, which will make it much easier to yeah, monitor and, and visualize the, the whole cluster status in its individual nodes. All right, I didn't dare challenging the demo gods at Fostem because network is usually something that you can't rely on. Um, you have to live with a few screenshots, but we have a live demo that you can toy around with if you like. Um, the links will be later at the stage. Um, this is a our traditional storage management dashboard, so to say. So this is what you see when you're using OpenAttic for managing traditional storage like Zamba, NFS, and so on. Um, you can create and define the volumes. They are listed over here. And for each volume, we also create um, uh, monitoring data and performance data that you can take a look at. Um, it's a bit hard to see. If you if you click on the demo, you, you can toy around with this and see it in more details. 
one of the things that is quite interesting and um, it's pretty unique. I haven't seen it in any other applications for us, what we call our API recorder. So as I said, the, the web UI uses the REST API exclusively, or the, the web UI uses the REST API exclusively to talk with the OpenATIC backend. And sometimes you don't want to use the UI, but you want to automate a, a certain task in a script or something through the OpenATIC REST API. So instead of having to look up the documentation for the API, you basically enable the, the API recorder in the UI and you click through the task that you want to accomplish once and then you stop the API recorder and it will automatically create a small Python script snippet that basically includes all the REST API calls that you have performed. So you can use these as a snippet or a template to embed in your application to get the same or to repeat this particular task. Um, this is the Ceph cluster dashboard. As you can see, we're using a different graphing engine here. Um, this way we are, we are extracting the data from the round robin database through JSON and then use um, JavaScript libraries to visualize it, which makes it much easier and much more dynamic to work with the data on the UI. Um, the dashboard is fully configurable, so you can resize and rearrange those widgets. You can have multiple dashboards. Um, and they are stored with your user profile. So if another administrator logs in, he can set up a dashboard by his means and, and doesn't have to take over what you have configured, basically. Um, you can also mix UI elements from both the traditional side or the, the Ceph cluster side. Um, or if you have multiple Ceph clusters, you have, could create one dashboard that shows you the overall view for both clusters in one page. Um, so you can really tweak it to your liking. Ceph pool list, um, as you see, we are always using the, the, the same um, UI elements with the data table on top and then the graphs underneath. Um, one thing that I have on my wish list is that I would like to make it possible that these graphs that are currently belong to a certain Ceph pool could also be taken and pinned onto the front dashboard. So you, if you have a certain pool that you want to monitor more closely, it should be possible to drag it on the on the front dashboard and make it visible there. Yeah, Ceph pool creation, some of the features that we support here. Boring. I'll skip all that. RBD, these are the block device lists. Um, now, I think the pull request is almost done that you will also see the, the utilization of the RBDs here. Thank you. OSD, yep, it's repeating, as I said, Screenshots are not as exciting as a live demo, but my past experiences at Fostem was that the network usually works by the time you're about to head home. So, oh, that's the crash map editor, as I said. Basically, you see a visualization of the topology and you're able to drag nodes around and you can add new nodes, change the properties here. And with that, I'm already at my link list. These are some of the resources that you can take a look on. Um, we have a Google group for discussion that serves as our mailing list slash forum if you want to get in touch. We are on hash OpenATIC on Freenode as well. So come over there if you have questions and suggestions. Um, most of the discussion really happens on Bitbucket in, in the form of the pull requests. There's a lot of communication between the developers working on the code. Um, and then, of course, on our bug tracker. Um, so. Yeah, these are the key resources to get in touch with us first. And with that, I'm a bit ahead of my time. Amazing. So if you have questions, we still have time for that. Ugh. I know, it's after lunch. <laughs> OK, there's a question. When is software ever ready? Um, when is software ever ready? No, um, Attic 2.0 is out, and based on, on all the, the testing that we do, we are pretty confident that each release that we publish is safe to use. The good thing about Open Attic, especially if you use it for traditional storage management, even though if Open Attic crashes, the, the actual serving of data is performed by other subsystems of your operating system, like the Samba server, like kernel NFS. We are not really in the path of serving the data to, to the users. So even if OpenATTIC has a problem, 
and it crashes, which doesn't really happen that often. Um, we are not messing with your data directly unless you really accidentally delete in something like that or so. Um, but we are still, of course, in the process of adding more functionality with each release. As I said, we have the train model. So what we have out right now is, is ready to use and can be used with, with, um, with confidence. But as I said, it's, we, are, we still have a lot of gaps to fill. And of course, we would like you to encourage to, to give it a try and help us um, gathering guidance of where we should focus on next. So we, we think that we have now come to a point where we provide a, a good set of useful functionality. We are aware we are not fully there yet compared to other projects, but we would like to get your feedback on, on what your use cases are and, and what, pers um, what you're looking for what we should be focusing on, basically. There was another question here. So the question was if we have any plans to support Kerberos for authentication. Um, the thing is, are you talking about using it for authenticating users to the web front end? And the answer is that should work. I haven't tested it. For